Hello audience, Mr. Z here on this dark, stormy night, in collaboration with my pal from Across the Pond, VC3 Productions. If you'd like to understand a little more about how Hitler came to power and how he changed Germany, go check out his video after this one. We, on the other hand, will be exploring the grander effects of the Second World War, and how the world might have been had it simply never happened. Surely you must be curious of the details on precisely how such a thing could have occurred, as yes, there was a fairly heavy stockpiling of fuel for these fires of war, from Germany's treaty-breaking remilitarization to their territorial expansion. We could simply prevent the ignition of that fuel, but that tension between nations would still exist, and likely manifest in the form of numerous smaller wars over the course of a few years. But I can work with that. So, what is our ignition point for World War II? Poland, of course. And why did Germany invade Poland? Well, for land. For other things too, but we don't want to get demonetized here. Specifically land lost in the wake of the First Great War, known as the Polish Corridor, which separated Germany from its land in East Prussia. Many of you are likely familiar most with the city of Danzig, which some might confuse for the entirety of the Polish Corridor, but there was a difference. It's about half. So, holy frickin' smokes. So, Germany and Poland already have a non-aggression pact, and a bargaining over the territory, while unlikely, isn't out of the question. See, that corridor is Poland's only port into the sea, something which happens to be quite essential to any nation that hopes to make a name for itself internationally, and not remain dependent on surrounding nations, which, if you're Poland, you know never ends well for you. But perhaps a compromise could be made. Poland had been looking to re-establish the Poland-Lithuanian Commonwealth following World War I, and with the neighboring USSR, a union with a country as formidable at fighting the communists Poland wouldn't be such a bad idea for a little old Lithuania there. So, if we assume Poland and Germany enter into an agreement to defend Lithuania from the USSR in exchange for the establishment of the PLC for Poland, we now have an arrangement which for Germany restores the pre-war Reich and earns it a powerful buffer ally against the Soviets, while Poland restores its ancestral borders and enters into a defensive pact with Germany. Yes, I know many of you will argue that German goals would have included the destruction and conquest of the USSR, but such a thing is still achievable through collaboration with Poland, and later partitioning the land or just backstabbing Poland and taking it all, which they are basically very capable of. This is Germany we're talking about, folks. Don't underestimate them. Alternatively, Germany could seek to restore some colonial assets in Africa lost during World War I for the resources there. Regardless of which, there are at least a few options for Germany to still achieve their goals while remaining allied to Poland in this arrangement. And even if that wasn't the case, I could argue for a timeline in which Germany invades Poland with France and Britain simply doing nothing. Why? Because up until Poland, that was the case. And there's no reason to assume Poland would have been any different. Italy invades Ethiopia despite both being members of the League of Nations and annexed the region while the League did nothing. Germany annexes Austria and the League does nothing. Japan invades China and the League did nothing. Germany invades Czechoslovakia again, the League did nothing. Although, it was at this point that Neville Chamberlain did put forth that Britain and France would accept Germany's claims to the land, so long as there'd be no further aggressive expansion by Germany. But this could not stop further partitioning of Czechoslovakia and demands for land aimed toward Poland and Lithuania. And even after that, Italy still conquers Albania. So, Britain and France could, in the sake of not wanting to risk another great war, simply stand down and accept that Germany is hell-bent on eastward expansion. Or, better yet, the nations could come to a resolution of redrawing borders to create a union out of Poland and Lithuania to defend against both German and Soviet aggression, while ceding the Polish corridor back to Germany in exchange for a peace pact between Germany, Poland, Britain, France, and Lithuania to cease all military expansion then and there. Germany could voice any remaining demands for land, and a vote could be put forth for exactly what exchanges will be made to acquire said land. Such a thing isn't too far-fetched. Hell, Germany just paying Poland for the land, and Britain and France mediating it, saying, yeah, this is alright. As even in our timeline, Germany continued negotiating for the city of Danzig, albeit aggressively, up until the invasion of Poland, going as far as to ask for at the very least a referendum of unification with Germany to be put to a vote by the citizens of the region. 
Since we're looking for the best means to prevent World War II and reduce as many national conflicts as possible, we'll be redrawing borders like this. Germany is able to fully reunite with East Prussia and restore some pre-war land holdings within Poland, with a Slovak Republic proxy state and a return of World War I German African colony Cameroon to appease German desires for greater resources. Poland and Lithuania unite into the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, while a plan is established and invitation put forth to the other Baltic states and Finland to join the Union should political or military pressures from the USSR rise. Germany is allowed access to Polish ports and allowed to maintain a limited number of bases along the Polish-Soviet border in exchange for German military support should conflicts arise between the USSR and Poland. At the time, there were tremendous concerns over the industrial development of the USSR, and there were some real worries by not only its neighbors, but Britain, France, and even Germany, who feared the future of a Europe potentially falling to communism country by country. So, it's fairly realistic to imagine these states, having put aside their differences, focusing on containing the USSR and communism from leaking to the rest of Europe. Italy would remain a belligerent, but granted the poor state of its military supplies, they wouldn't pose too significant a threat, and if not giving up after an initial number of failed campaigns, likely against either France, Greece, Britain, or Yugoslavia, they'd certainly find themselves forced back into their place. Japan in this time would continue its campaign against China, while the Soviets supported the Chinese Communists through the North. French Indochina likely wouldn't fall under Japanese control, as France would never be invaded by Germany, and authority would never be handed over to Japan. Tibet, having been caught between the Kuomintang, communist, and perhaps eventual Japanese rule, sought protection from Britain and would soon become a protectorate. The Chinese communists would establish a new People's Republic with Mongolia under heavy Soviet influence, while Japan pushed deeper into mainland China. The Baltic states and Finland, following increased strong manning by the Soviet Union, would enter into the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth to establish the Intermarium, a between-seas border state whose purpose would be to prevent conflicts between Eastern and Western Europe. This would have been the earlier mentioned plan Britain, France, and Poland had agreed upon to ensure peace throughout Europe for the foreseeable future. This would, with the later addition of Romania, who stood now alone at the Soviet's Western Front, create a massive buffer state between Russia and Western Europe, with a military capable of fending off either the USSR or the German Reich who would have been thriving on the European economic scene, becoming a leading producer in weaponry, industry, mechanics, and more, allowing it to purchase a number of colonial holdings from France, who was at the time undergoing its own gradual regime change. See, prior to the war, in our timeline, France was seeing some internal political upheaval. Having seen some of the worst battles of the First Great War, there was a tremendous amount of disillusionment and dissatisfaction within veterans and the youth, all of whom sought to make a change in their society. This led to, just as in Germany a decade prior, numerous far-right and far-left parties rising. And just before the outbreak of the Second World War, the far-right French Popular Party, not to be confused with the far-left French Popular Front, despite having been outlawed by the French Republic, was booming in popularity. It, along with the also far-right French Social Party, that's, uh... French Social Party, that just sounds like a friendly gathering. <clears throat> La Partie Sociale Française, that's better. And it is often speculated that had war not broken out, France would have gone much the route of Spain, Italy, and Germany, while Britain might see its own right-wing wave rise to counter the new focused enemy of communism. This regime change in France could lead the way for Italy to attempt to establish the Latin bloc with Spain and France, but Italy... it's Italy. It, it probably wouldn't happen. And while we're on the subject of regime change, the U.S. is still facing down the Depression. Japan is far too preoccupied with its business in China to direct forces elsewhere, now dealing with remnant Kuomintang soldiers and Chinese communists along the northern border. Thus, Pearl Harbor would need to wait, and the U.S. war industry is never kicked into gear. The U.S. simply would have no war to supply overseas, and FDR's policies, be it intentional or not, bring the nation closer and closer to socialism day by day, with greater taxation, government spending, and social services being established, while the still struggling public feels it's not enough. Earlier on in 1930, there had been fears of a supposed business plot to overthrow FDR and install a pro-corporation fascist government, driving the U.S. not to have a red scare, but a fascist scare. The political scene in Europe left them feeling isolated. There was no one to sell to, especially with Germany now producing superior products locally and for a better price. 
social services and policies were the only things cushioning the burden of the depression, and FDR becomes increasingly desperate to find a remedy, pushing top income tax rates to 95%, while unemployment stays stagnant, even rising in some parts as business owners find themselves forced to shut down or hire fewer employees. The Soviets could take advantage of these conditions to begin lending aid to the US, disseminating pro-communist propaganda and even building factories on American soil to create more local jobs while aiding Soviet production. It would be through these gradual processes that the US would slide deeper and deeper into a communistic tunnel. And with the passing of FDR, so would the door be open for a further left America to elect a new leader to complete the task FDR had begun of creating a socialist America. The Soviets would certainly play some significant role in both funding and promoting the Communist Party USA, just as they had funded them during the Cold War in our timeline. Only now they'd have the opportunity to raise them to a higher position of power, and it would be with that done that the Soviets would conquer the US not through war, but through various means of subversion, cultural, economic, and political. The world of this timeline is a vastly different place. The US would never become a dominant world power and influence post-world Europe as it did in our timeline. Instead, it became a proxy state of the Soviet Union until it inevitably breaks off and becomes its own communist power just as China or Yugoslavia did, likely going on to incorporate Central America and the Caribbean into a grander United Socialist States of America. Western Europe and its empires remain a dominant force in the world, never being weakened by the Second World War and being able to retain the majority of their colonial holdings. Germany and Britain would become chief competitors while major conflicts between East and West are prevented by the Intermarium Buffer State and a greater Yugoslav state keeping the Balkans united against the potential aggressions of either Turkey or Italy. War would likely begin to intensify between the Japanese and Soviets while a communist America could pose a greater threat to the Japanese Pacific Empire. If the Japanese Empire proceeds to reinforce the Anglo-Japanese alliance, this could lead us to something of a greater world war that could draw in the US, Canada, Germany, and Intermarium. War on the grand scale, however, would be inevitable. While the conflict within Western Europe was resolved without bloodshed, a greater conflict between it and the communistic world now existed. And such a war would be greater than any conflict ever seen before. The US of Z, thanks for watching. Support your legion by liking this video and sharing it to boost the algorithms, or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Support us on Patreon and check out our Discord server if you'd like to meet the rest of the community. Mr. Z, out.